Good afternoon, class. This lecture is going to cover Chapter 5, which is the introduction to pathophysiology. This is just going to be a lot of information, just like the last chapter. You're also going to need to spend a fair amount of time in your book. Let's get started. All right, the objectives for this chapter are to define the following terms. Aerobic metabolism, anaerobic metabolism, cardiac output, cell membrane, cell nucleus, dead airspace, dehydration, DNA, edema, electrolytes, metabolism, the word patent, that's not patient, just note the difference, it's patent, pathophysiology, perfusion, stroke volume, tidal volume. We're also going to explain the importance of understanding the basic pathophysiology, differentiate between the processes of aerobic and anaerobic cellular metabula metabolism, explain the concept of perfusion, including the components necessary to maintain perfusion, describe the composition of ambient air, Ambient air, guys, is the air we're breathing right now. Explain how changes in respiratory system function can affect ventilation. Describe the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. Discuss factors that affect cardiac output. Describe the two ways the heart can fail, resulting in decreased cardiac output. Model a desire, model a desire for continuous quality improvement, or CQI both personally and professionally. Value the importance of quality research and its connection to good patient care. Now, the topics we're going to cover are going to be pathophysiology, the cardiopulmonary system. Your medical terminology should come into play I'm trying to figure out what cardiopulmonary means. Just take a look at that word and reference your last chapter if you need to. Hypoperfusion and shock. All right, so let's get started with pathophysiology. All right, pathophysiology is the study of how disease processes affect the body. It allows for better identification of certain signs and symptoms to a specific course of treatment. All right, the cell. Um, the cell is a basic unit of the human body. All organs and systems are composed of cells. Uh, cell membrane, that's the outer protective layer of the cell. It's kind of like the skin on your body. It just protects the internal organs of the cell, or as actually with the cell you refer to them as organelles. Controls movements in and out of the cell. That means it restricts what can pass between that membrane. Disease processes can alter the effectiveness of the cell membrane. All right, the nucleus of the cell is the basically the brain of the cell. It's the control center of the cell, if you will. All right, glucose is a basic unit. Uh, I'm sorry, glucose is a basic nutrient for the cell. It's uh, converted to energy through metabolism, which we'll get to in a minute. You get aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, just for a little preview. All right, water. Membrane regulates the movement in and out of the cell. Cells dry up and die without enough water. Cellular function is in interrupted with too much water also as well. Influences the concentration of electrolytes. All right, oxygen as it relates to the cell, it fuels metabolism. It's a huge component of aerobic metabolism. Just uh, keep in mind Aerobic means with oxygen. Normal glucose metabolism using oxygen. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct of this type of metabolism. All right. Anaerobic metabolism. Abnormal glucose metabolism without oxygen. It's very inefficient. You don't produce energy nearly as well with anaerobic metabolism as you do with um, aerobic metabolism. 
creates increased byproducts of carbon dioxide and lactic acid. Uh, lactic acid is something unique to anaerobic metabolism. It's like the difference between running a long distance as in marathon runners or sprinting a short distance. Say if you're running a 40 yard dash in some type of athletic event, uh, the long term endurance runner is going to use mostly aerobic metabolism with oxygen. The sprinter is going to use anaerobic metabolism and produce energy without oxygen. Therefore, they're going to build up some lactic acid. You get wound up with an accumulation of waste. It makes the body acidic and toxic when you're using anaerobic metabolism more than it should be. All right. Aerobic metabolism requires an adequate supply of oxygen and glucose. Uh, this is just a basic diagram explaining how aerobic metabolism works. If you look at the first arrow that's pointing down, it's pointing um, at a, what you call a mitochondria. The glucose is going to go into there. The mitochondria, which is the brownish colored oval shape, is going to produce energy with the glucose and oxygen. And it's going to put that out. So glucose, oxygen, go into play with this, and energy is a byproduct. This one is anaerobic metabolism. If you'll see below the cell, the right hand side, you see it says no oxygen. So glucose enters the cell, the mitochondria. It's going to produce just a small amount of ATP or energy. That's the same thing. It's less efficient. It also produces a lot of lactic acid, and you just can't sustain long term with anaerobic metabolism. All right, um, fluid balance. Average human body is made up of about 60% water. Balance is necessary for proper cellular function. So the body's percentage of water is variable depending on the body composition. It's, it can range anywhere from 50 to about 70% water depending on body composition, but for the purposes of this class and any test that you have, the correct answer is 60. All right, the body adjusts to fluid levels through intake and elimination of fluids. So you can take fluids in by drinking them. You also get a significant amount of fluid through your food. Get rid of it by sweating, breathing, actually um, uses a large amount of your fluid throughout the day that's generally not thought of and urination is also your main way that you lose fluid alright uh, dehydration that means not enough fluid intake or it can also be caused by excessive fluid elimination such as vomiting and diarrhea Dehydration specifically occurs when you lose a lot of your fluids, but you don't lose your electrolytes necessarily. So your blood winds up being more concentrated. That can cause some other issues. That goes beyond the scope of this class, though. We'll pick up on some of that for those of you who move on to the EMT portion of the class. All right, edema or swelling, uh, those two words are interchangeable. Edema is just swelling. All right, so edema is caused by fluid trapped in the body's tissues from illness. A lot of times it can be concentrated in the hands, legs, and feet. A lot of times it's systemic, but since the hands, legs, and feet are more distal, and the structures themselves are generally smaller, the edema is more noticeable in these areas. So when you have an injury, your capillaries, which are the smallest units of blood vessels that you have in your body, uh, will leak and they'll let um, fluid leak out of them and it can just cause more edema in the extremities especially. All right. A patient's fluid balance can easily be assessed ex externally. Uh, dry mucous membranes, which are generally around your eyes, uh, lips, low blood pressure can indicate dehydration. 
Um, edema in the ankles and feet can give an indication of four, uh, of poor fluid distribution. So when you see somebody with extremely swollen ankles that just has an extreme amount of fluid build up, it's an indication that they've got a lot of capillary leakage that can be caused by uh, a lot of different things and a lot of disease processes. Again, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this emergency medical responder course. We'll touch on it a little bit when we get into some other body systems, but it's just something to look for, and it can also be related to your respiratory calls and your cardiac calls. All right, let's get started going over the cardiopulmonary system. All right, so looking back at the medical terminology, <laughs> let's break this word down. Cardiopulmonary. All right, so the first part of that word lets us know we're talking about the heart. Cardio generally is going to refer to the heart. Pulmonary, uh, first part of that where it starts with the P, and uh, anything that's relating to pulmonary is going to involve your lungs, so that's just something to think about. Always look back at your medical terminology when you're questioning what a word means. All right, cardiopulmonary system, um, cardiovascular and respiratory systems both work together. The respiratory system transfers oxygen to the bloodstream. The cardiovascular system transports oxygen to the body's cells. It also brings carbon dioxide back to the lungs for elimination. All right, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the respiratory system. The structures of the respiratory system include the airway, which starts at your nose and mouth, goes all the way into your lungs. Uh, your lungs break into a lot of different um, sections. And you've got your muscles of respiration. So the biggest one we're going to focus on in this class will be your diaphragm. We'll also talk about your... Uh, intercostal muscles and your accessory muscles of respiration probably in a different section though all right airway uh, this involves movement of air in and out of the chest and requires a patent airway so when they're referring to patent airway that means just an open airway you can't have any type of obstruction or anything blocking your airway or you're not going to be able to move air in and out. Upper airway obstructions. Uh, obstructions have the above the trachea prevent air from reaching the lower airway. This can result in a altered mental status. It could be from foreign bodies that you've put in your mouth or have wound up in your mouth and obstructs the airway. It can also be caused by trauma uh, for blood. I mean, really anything that's a byproduct of, product of trauma, it can, blood, teeth, bone, anything can obstruct your airway. Or it can, it can actually be the anatomy can be crushed or distorted because of the trauma as well. All right. Um, airway, more specifically the lower airway complications. Bronchoconstriction increases airway resistance and decreases the amounts of air that reach the alveoli. So this is, for instance, asthma. The next slide will give us something to look at. To, I can point out what bronchoconstriction actually means, but I'm sure somebody in this class has asthma, and it just means that your bronchioles, the smooth muscle, will constrict because it'll... Uh, become swollen and it decreases the amount of air that reaches the alveoli and you also have problems getting the air back out of the lungs. Alright, so right here we're looking at a um, picture of a bronchiole with alveoli on the end. The alveoli are the circular brown things and the bronchioles are the red things so the bronchioles are what are going to constrict and make it where you can't get the air that you've taken in to the alveoli 
Um, alveolus are the site of gas exchange. If you're not able to get air to them, you're not going to get any carbon dioxide out of the blood and you're not going to get any oxygen into the blood. Um, so it's very important that you don't have any bronchial constriction. It's just going to make it where you're going to not be able to get good gas exchange, guys. All right. The diaphragm and the chest wall are responsible for pressure changes that stimulate breathing. So when you take a breath in, it's because your diaphragm is expanding the volume of the inside of the chest. This causes a negative pressure and allows you to suck air in from the atmosphere, which is just all the air that's around us, in through your airway and down into your lungs. Tidal volume, that's considered the air that's moved in and out in one breath. Tidal volume can be spontaneous through spontaneous respirations like you and I are just sitting here breathing. You can also have tidal volume that we're delivering when we get into using bag valve masks or ventilators in further, uh, more advanced courses. But tidal volume is just the amount of air that's moved in and out in one breath, whether that breath is artificial or natural. Now the cardiopulmonary system continued. Uh, lungs do have dead space. It's what is referred to as the air in the space between the mouth and the alveoli. So the only place in your lungs that you're actually getting gas exchange is what makes it to your alveoli. Again, those were the brown circular things at the end of your bronchioles. That's generally about 150 milliliters um, in the average adult. So you just got to keep in mind the dead space is part of your tidal volume, but you're not able to use approximately 150 milliliters or 150 cc's of your tidal volume for gas exchange. All right, respiratory system dysfunction. This is the distribution of respiratory control. Damage to the medulla oblongata. This occurs in stroke, brain tumors, infection, ingestion of toxins or other drugs, high spinal cord injuries, and other diseases. Basically what this is saying is medulla oblongata is part of your brain. Your respiratory centers are located in your medulla oblongata. I know if any of us have ever seen the movie Waterboy, that everybody thinks the medulla oblongata is what made his alligators ornery. That's unfortunately not the case. <laughs> it, it plays a big part in respiratory control. All right. Uh, disruption of pressure. All right, so the chest cavity is a closed container. The diaphragm, ribs, and intercostal muscles change the size of the cavity. So like I said earlier, your diaphragm is your main muscle of respiration. It kind of goes across the bottom of the chest cavity and it moves up and down to increase the size of the cavity itself. If I can find a video that's specifically about the diaphragm, I'll be sure to send you guys a link in your messages. Uh, you also have the ribs and intercostal muscles. So your um, intercostal muscles are located in between the ribs and some are outside your ribs. You got internal and external intercostal muscles. Those aren't something that you generally use in passive breathing. This is more of an accessory muscle uh, for when you have some labored breathing or increased respirations for whatever reason. All right. We're going to continue on with some dysfunct disruption of pressure. All right, so lungs are attached to the chest with two membranes. The parietal pleura are on the chest wall and the visceral pleura 
or on the lung. So let's talk about the terms parietal and visceral briefly. Parietal, when you're referring to membranes, is going to be the lining that is not directly attached to the excuse me to the um, organ itself. And the visceral pleura always refers to what is attached to the organ itself. All right, so the pleural space is what's going to be in between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. Um, let's see, so when you're thinking about the parietal and visceral pleura, you got to think about it as the parietal pleura is like the container. And the visceral pleura is what's covering what's inside the container. In between them, you have what's called the pleural space. During injury, this may accumulate blood or air. Um, if it accumulates blood, you would refer to that as a hemothorax. If you'll use your medical terminology for that, hema means blood. Thorax would refer to the chest. And air would refer to a pneumothorax. That's pneumothorax. If you'll use your medical terminology for that, pneumo means air. And thorax is going to refer to the chest cavity. That's something we'll get into later in trauma, those two things. But it's just something to keep in mind now. All right. Disruption of pressure continued. Expanded chest cavity creates negative pressure and lets air in. The relaxed chest cavity creates positive pressure and forces air out. So when you're taking a breath in, you're actually having a contraction of the um, diaphragm. This is going to expand the size of your chest cavity and create a negative pressure which basically sucks air into your lungs. This is the active part of breathing. So when your diaphragm relaxes, the chest cavity uh, size decreases. When it's decreasing, you're creating a positive pressure within the chest cavity and it's going to force air out of your upper airway. A hole in the chest wall affects the changes in pressure. Uh, this could be from a gunshot wound, a stabbing, um, you know, any type of traumatic injury that punctures the chest wall from the outside and comes through your, what we refer to as the parietal pleura. This results frequently in uh, what you would consider a pneumothorax, which in itself is not terribly dangerous, but it can progress into a tension pneumothorax, which is an immediately life-threatening emergency, something that your paramedics on scene are going to be treating mostly, but we'll go over that more when it comes to trauma and how it affects the respiratory system. All right, blood or air in the pleural space creates a hemothorax or a pneumothorax. We already talked about that earlier, but if you look at the words again, hemo refers to blood, thorax refers to chest, so that's going to refer to blood in the chest cavity, specifically between the parietal and visceral pleura. All right, a pneumothorax, if you look at the first part of the word pneumo, it's going to refer to air. And thorax is going to refer to chest, so that's going to be air being trapped between the visceral and parietal pleura of the lungs. All right, damage to lung tissue reduces the ability for gas exchange. Remember we talked about the only place gas exchange occurs is going to be in the alveoli. There are literally millions of alveoli in everybody's lungs. So if you have a small portion of your lung that is injured or has some type of specific illness, uh, you're still going to be able to get adequate gas exchange. Larger, more diffuse injuries to the lung can cause some significant problems in gas exchange. Trauma, pneumonia, infection. Reduced oxygen levels and increased carbon dioxide levels can be a result of any of these things. All right, brain monitors carbon dioxide levels in the blood. Increases or decreases respir in respiration rate and tidal volume is needed. So when we have, so say if you hold your breath 
and you hold your breath, hold your breath, hold your breath, eventually your body is going to force you to take a breath. A lot of people feel like it's because you're getting low of oxygen. Your stimulus to breathe is um, controlled by your carbon dioxide levels. So we don't really have a hypoxic drive to breathe, which would mean that we're breathing because our oxygen levels are low. You're generally breathing because your body's built up carbon dioxide and it wants to get that carbon dioxide out of your body and into the atmosphere. We'll get more into that a little bit later, but that's the basic idea. Just keep in mind that your stimulus to breathe in a normal healthy person comes from high CO2 levels or high carbon dioxide levels and generally not from low oxygen levels. There are some exceptions to that. I'm not going to get into that right now, though. All right, let's talk about the blood. This is the transport system of the body. Insufficient quantity leads to poor circulation. So this means if you've lost a lot of blood, your circulation is going to be decreased. Your blood vessels are going to be the pathways of circulation. Arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart and veins carry deoxygenated blood to the heart there are two exceptions to this rule within the human body it's a little out of the scope of this class however those of you that move on to the EMT class will get into that but for the purposes of this class arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart and out to the tissues of the body and the veins carry deoxygenated blood from the tissues back to the heart. It's also picking up the carbon dioxide that the tissues have created and bringing it back to the heart to pump into the lungs and get back out into the atmosphere. All right, arterioles, uh, they feed oxygenated blood to the capillaries. Capillaries, again, we talked about are the smallest units um, of blood vessels in your body. They're very, very small, and they, they're distributed into all of your tissues at a microscopic level. They're going to offload oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide. So during cellular metabula metabolism, your cells are going to be producing carbon dioxide as a byproduct of uh, generally, uh, we're hoping we're you know, involved in aerobic um metabolism so when you produce all this carbon dioxide it's got to go somewhere and your capillaries are going to facilitate that and they're also going to drop oxygen off that's coming from your lungs and your heart that have just been oxygenated so it's going to drop that off and it's going to pick up some carbon dioxide all right blood vessels are pathways continued now your pulmonary arteries these are the exceptions that I was talking about. Apparently, we are going to cover them in this class. I did not think we would. Um, but pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. So these are the only arteries in your body that are going to carry deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. Pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. I'm not going to get into this right now. It's just it's too involved for this lecture in this class. But the takeaway is pulmonary arteries are the only arteries in the body that carry deoxygenated blood. And the pulmonary veins are the only veins in the body they carry oxygenated blood directly from the lungs. All right, blood pressure. All right, so blood pressure is created by the beating heart to move blood around the body. So your blood pressure is just what pushes your blood through all your arteries, into your capillaries, into your veins, and then back to your heart. Uh, pressure comes from the actual contraction of your heart, and it, like I said, just pushes your blood through the entire system all the way back to where it started at. All 
All right. Uh, the diameter of blood vessels and volume of blood directly affects the amount of pressure. Dilated vessels and blood loss decreases pressure. All right, so dilation of blood vessels can come from uh, a lot of different things. Some common stuff are allergic reactions or what you would consider anaphylaxis. This may be why your friend or a loved one carries an EpiPen in their purse or in their truck or, you know, anywhere just in case they have an alleg allergic reaction. Um, generally, when your blood vessels dilate, your blood pressure is going to decrease, which is referred to as hypotension. All right. Constricted blood vessels or increased fluid in the blood increases your pressure. So the constriction of blood vessels can come from chronic smoking, drugs, or just bad genetics. Increased fluid is associated with congestive heart failure. This just puts a lot of stress on your heart and can eventually cause fluid to build up and cause heart failure. Results of hypertension include stroke, heart attack, and kidney failure. Hypertension is often referred to as a silent killer. A lot of people don't even realize their blood pressure is up because there's nothing that makes you consciously aware of it. A lot of people wind up on dialysis because of uncontrolled hypertension. Sometimes that's because you know you have hypertension and you just chose not to control it. Sometimes it's because you had no idea you had high blood pressure because you haven't been to the doctor. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Alright, the heart. The heart is a four-chambered pump designed to move blood. If you think about it in a mechanical way, actually as a mechanical pump, a lot of times it'll help people understand it better. I'm not going to get into it on this particular slide, but we'll discuss it either later in this section or in a section later in the book. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that's ejected from the heart in one contraction. So the stroke volume is going to be measured the blood that's coming out of your left ventricle and going into your systemic circulation. So it's going to um, be that amount of blood, whatever that measure is, per person. And it can vary, but it's generally about 70 cc's. All right. Uh, cardiac output. It's the amount of blood ejected from the heart in one minute. So this is your stroke volume times your heart rate. It'll give you what your cardiac output is. Again, that stroke volume times heart rate gives you what your cardiac output is. Increased heart rate leads to an increased cardiac output up to a certain point. If the rate's too fast, the output's actually going to decrease. Generally, you're going to start seeing symptoms of decreased cardiac output when you reach around 150. A more accepted number is 180. You're almost certainly going to have decreased cardiac output if the rate increases to 180. And that's specifically for adults. Kids are a little bit different, but we'll cover that in a pediatric chapter. All right. Um, the autonomic nervous system response adjusts cardiac output. The sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight response, that's when you get scared or you're in a crazy situation and your body is just amped up. Um, you feel invincible. You wind up with strength increasing, and that's all based on a sympathetic response or a dump of hormones into your bloodstream that causes your body to react like that. A parasympathetic, a parasympathetic response is generally going to be the opposite of that. Your heart rate is going to decrease, blood vessels are going to relax, and blood's going to be pumped to areas of your body that are not necessarily vital for life. All right, heart failure. There's two types, two ways that you can have heart failure. It's going to be electrical or mechanical. Electrical failure generally results in tachycardia, bradycardia, 
or ventricular fibrillation. Tachycardia, if you look at the word, tachy means fast, and cardia refers to the heart. Brady means slow, and cardio refers to the heart. So tachycardia is fast heart rate. Bradycardia is slow heart rate. Ventricular fibrillation, that's going to be the rhythm that when you're treating some a cardiac arrest victim, if you're AED or automated external defibrillator that you're using tells you to advise, I mean to deliver a shock, you're generally going to either be in ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. It's the it's for all practical purposes during a cardiac arrest, it's the same thing, but they both occur from an electrical issue with your heart. Mechanical failure can result from trauma. Uh, squeezing of the heart muscle, which is also related to trauma, or loss of cardiac muscle due to cell death. So with the trauma and the squeezing of the heart muscle, it's referring to you've got a what you call a pericardial sac, and it goes around the heart, and just like in the lungs, you can get blood trapped in there. You can get blood trapped in between the heart lining and the heart itself, and it can make it where your heart's not able to contract and then expand. And this has a significant decrease in cardiac output. Advanced providers will go in and relieve the um, blood that's built up in the pericardial sac. That's referred to as uh, pericardial synthesis. That's something that's beyond the spoke. Sco- uh, I'm sorry. That's something that's beyond the scope of this class. We'll probably talk about it in some labs just to get everybody familiar with it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, The loss of cardiac muscle due to cell death. This is going to occur when somebody has what we refer to as a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Uh, Just one thing to keep in mind, there's a difference between a heart attack and going into cardiac arrest. A heart attack is just going to be a blockage of a one of your coronary arteries and it can result in muscle and cell death and this can cause that particular section of the heart that is supplied by blood so I mean supplied with blood by that particular artery to die and it can cause the heart to not function appropriately alright the best way to assess the patient's tidal volume is to watch the chest rise and fall while counting the ventilations per minute so if you're getting adequate chest rise and fall their tidal volumes probably pretty good if their chest is barely moving you know they may not have adequate ventilation and you may have to assist that with a bag valve mask hypoxia can lead to cell death getting your patient on oxygen uh, can delay the change over to anaerobic metabolism remember we talked about anaerobic metabolism which is producing energy without oxygen available it's not very efficient it is really hard on the body and it produces a lot of byproducts that can throw you into acidosis which is just uh, not something we want to be dealing with it can cause all kinds of problems low blood pressure can lead to hypoxia and cell death What are some ways that EMRs can attempt to increase pressure? Um, As an EMR, there's not a whole lot of actual interventions that you can do. But you can help by laying a patient down. You can help by elevating their legs. And we'll go over some more practical application stuff in class. But your book does a pretty good job of describing that as well. We're going to move over into hypoperfusion and shock all right so we know what hypo means that means low or inadequate and perfusion we just learned what perfusion is so hypo perfusion means low perfusion and shock they kind of go hand in hand all right perfusion delivery of oxygen and nutrients and the removal of waste to every cell in the body okay so this requires blood pressure that's what we were talking about earlier that to have perfusion you have to have a blood pressure if your blood pressure is low you're not going to be perfusing your body adequately so that's one of the big reasons why we've got to maintain an adequate blood pressure all 
Yeah, all components of the cardio cardiopulmonary system must be functioning for adequate perfusion to occur. Oxygen delivered all the way to the alveoli and carbon dioxide traveled all, transported all the way out. Enough available blood, functioning pump, and enough pressure make this exchange possible. Shock occurs when perfusion fails. And this is referred to as hypoperfusion. Uh, the cells are going to become hypoxic without perfusion of adequate oxygen. They're going to switch over to anaerobic metabolism. Lactic acid and waste are going to build up and the cells are eventually going to die. So when somebody is said to be in shock, it just means that they have a lack of perfusion somewhere in their body. And this could be an area that's a little more specific, or it could be systemic, which is what we're going to be focused on mostly in this class. Right, there's some ways that the body can compensate for shock. The sympathetic nervous system compensates for hypoperfusion. Your vessels are going to constrict. Your heart rate is going to increase. Your pupils will dilate. Your skin is going to start sweating. Your brain responds to increased levels of carbon dioxide by increasing your respiration, respiratory rate and making those breaths a little bit deeper. All right, one thing about kids is they compensate a little bit differently than adults than adults. So shock and hypoperfusion are one of the leading causes of death in pediatric patients. Children definitely compensate differently, and I can't say that enough. The increased heart rate is the main way they're going to compensate. So a kid, you know, with lack of blood volume, whether that be from trauma or some illness such as that's causing vomiting or diarrhea, their heart rate can really go to extraordinary limits to keep their blood pressure uh, maintained. Vasoconstriction is going to allow them to maintain a blood pressure even with a significant volume loss. Blood pressure is a very unreliable factor during your assessment of pediatric patients. Um, also, kids have higher metabolisms than adults and they're going to burn through oxygen a lot faster, relatively speaking. Uh, so since children um, are better at compensating than adults, you have a false sense of security with your primary impression to the patient. You got to continually assess the uh, changes in kids because they'll compensate, 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 and they'll look fine. Everything will be great. You're like, okay, this kid's not hurt that bad. Then all of a sudden they'll crash. You don't have the advanced warning like you will with adult patients. So that's just something to keep in mind. You really need to assess the mechanism and the, uh, extent of the injury because a kid can fool you and it's a terrible situation when you think the kid is less sick than they actually are and then they crash on you all right recognizing uh, compensation is an important element in the assessment of the patient because it can rapid it rapidly identify the patient in shock emr should always be on the lookout for telltale signs of shock such as increased heart rate decreased blood pressure and abnormal respiratory rates. So the thing that's going to start uh, quickest is you're going to start seeing a change in the heart rate. It's generally going to go up. Uh, you're in initial shock. You're not going to see any change in the blood pressure. You're not really going to see any change in the respiratory rate. But as it progresses in different classes of shock, which we're not going to get into at this very time, you're going to see eventually a decrease in blood pressure and your respiratory rate will generally increase uh, with a couple exceptions that we'll go over a little bit later in this course. All right, so let's go through a summary of this section. Understanding pathophysiology helps you understand the basic and most important functions of the body and their critical dysfunctions. It's a delicate balance of fluid in the body. The levels must be appropriate in the major spaces and balanced constantly to maintain life. This is also referred to as homeostasis. Aerobic metabolism. 
the normal way the body converts glucose into energy this is the most efficient and it produces the most energy possible anaerobic metabolism it's not as efficient and it creates a lot more waste product this is not good for your body so keep in mind aerobic metabolism is good anaerobic metabolism is bad now that's going to be the basics for this class perfusion combined function of the respiratory and cardiovascular systems all functions need needed in order to deliver oxygenated blood to the cells oxygen is introduced to the body from the ambient air just keep in mind the ambient air is what we're breathing in the respiratory system moves air in and out of the lungs inspired air which is the air you breathe in that's all inspired means is the air that you're breathing in from the atmosphere pairs with the circulating blood for perfusion appropriate quantities ensure adequate delivery of oxygen to the cells transport mechanism of oxygen carbon dioxide and nutrients for the cells it requires the presence of appropriate elements of blood blood pressure within the system and a functioning pump or heart it relies on a constant supply of glucose and oxygen so cellular metabolism relies on a constant supply of glucose and oxygen that goes back a couple slides to the aerobic metabolism is a preferred type normal metabolism replies upon the perfusion and the successful operation of the cardiopulmonary system you got to get oxygen and you got to get glucose to the cells for them to be able to produce injury um, energy in the mitochondria okay all right let's go over a few review questions right, how is the process of aerobic metabolism different from the process of anaerobic metabolism all right guys take a couple seconds and think about that we went over it several times in this lecture um, so aerobic metabolism is the preferred way to produce energy it takes oxygen and glucose and converts it into energy uh, you're gonna get way more energy in this type of metabolism anaerobic metabolism is not preferred this is kind of like we've got to produce oxygen I mean we've got to produce energy regardless but we don't have oxygen to do it so we're gonna do the best we can with what we have to work with uh, it's much less efficient you don't get nearly as much oxygen during this process and you're gonna produce a lot of waste products that can throw you into uh, shock so it's just something to keep in mind what is perfusion and what are the components necessary to maintain it all right so you've got to have um, so perfusion is the constant supply of blood and oxygen to the tissues and you've got to have an adequate blood pressure and an intact respiratory system to maintain it uh, so your heart and lungs have to be uh, functioning for this to work out all right how do changes in respiratory function affect ventilation all right so if you're experiencing some issue that's causing you to breathe extremely fast you're going to blow off a lot of co2 uh, that's going to just be the issue with excessive uh, respiratory rate if you're breathing slow you're gonna have a buildup of co2 in your body and you're also eventually going to have a um, deficit in oxygen that's needed All right, how are oxygen and carbon dioxide transported in the blood so we're not there's several ways that each one of these are transported in the blood for the purposes of this class oxygen is generally going to be transported attached to the hemoglobin which are your red blood cells um, carbon dioxide can be transported as dissolved gas as bicarbonate or also as carbaminohemoglobin that's something your book will go over or if you want more clarification I'll send you some links that'll maybe show a video of that it'll be easier to explain what are the two ways the heart can fail and result in decreased cardiac output so generally you have 
electrical or mechanical okay so electrical is going to involve the electrical pathway system in your heart um, that's something that's we'll touch on but it's kind of out of the scope of this class but depending on where your electrical system is affected it can cause your heart to be extremely slow or in certain you know instances it can cause an extremely fast heart rate it can also cause you to go into cardiac arrest which would generally be ventricular fibrillation uh, then you have mechanical that can be caused by trauma or it can be caused by a decrease in blood volume now, what are the responses by the body when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated? So this is going to be your fight or flight response. Your blood vessels are constrict. Um, you know, you're, you're basically just going to be preparing to either fight or, you know, take flight. Uh, your book does a very good job explaining this, so just take a look at that. All right, the next uh, slide is going to give you a additional resource it's pretty good you can go to bradybooks.com and you can follow the resource central links to access some more content for this textbook I'm gonna go and get some links and send them to you guys in text messages so that should really you know bridge any gaps that we may have from this lecture in your book if you guys have any questions about this feel free to reach out to myself or any of the other instructors in this class be glad to help you out. We're going to try to do a Q&A, which is going to be optional, on Monday night. I'll send you out a link whenever we get that worked out. But if you have any questions about any of this content, be sure to reach out to whoever's going to be doing this question and answer session. Clear everything up before we take our next exam. All right, hope you guys have plenty of time and are able to study you know for this these this section there's a lot of information to cover don't take it lightly see you guys on wednesday